Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Art Forum. If you haven't met me before, my name's David Sequera, and I'm the director of the Margaret Lawrence Gallery. And I'm also the person that puts together the Art Forum program. And, um, you know, a really big welcome to you. Before I introduce our guest speaker, I do want to take a moment to acknowledge the Bunwurrung and Burundri people of the Greater Kulin Nation and to really uh, join you in grounding ourselves in the idea that before, you know, for many, many generations before the VCA and the University of Melbourne were even thought of, that the Bunwurrung and Wurundjeri people practiced song and dance, they made paintings and sculptures, they shared stories. And these rituals continue today, and it really is with a great deal of joy that I pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging. Born in Georgia, the former USSR in 1976 and migrating to Australia in 1996, Nina Sanadze uses her practice to respond to and grapple with a myriad of contemporary socio-political and personal developments. Presenting appropriated original artifacts, blunt replicas and documentary films as witnesses and evidence, Nina's work seeks to re-examine grand political narratives from a diametric personal position. Nina is a very recent graduate of BF, the BFA painting program and the honors program here at the Victorian College of the Arts. Nina has exhibited widely, including in artist run initiatives and the, hang on, I've got to say this properly, Nina can correct it in a moment, Sibilisi Triennial in Georgia through to public art installations across St Kilda. And she's the winner of the 2018 Incinerator Art Award, Art for Social Change. Nina has an upcoming show at Dane Singer's Gallery and her major work, Apotheosis, will be on show at the Living Museum of the West as part of the exhibition, The Image is Not Nothing, Concrete Archives, curated by Lisa Radford and Ioani Skiers. And I'll be talking about that a little bit at the end of this lecture. Wherever you are, please join me in making Nina very, very welcome. Thank you so much, David. I'll take it from here. Hello everyone. I would like to begin also by acknowledging the Bunwurrung and Wurundjeri people of this cooling nation and paying my respects to elders past, present and future. As a very early career artist, I'm really honored to be here. So my presentation today is quite autobiographical, personal and chronological. I've chosen to show my career development due to the relationship between my experience and the semiotically loaded materials I respond to and use. These have taken on so much significance in discussion on a global scale with the recent attention being paid to the contentious role of monuments and public, in public art and ideological formation and memory. I come from a time and place where propaganda art was proactive element of the political, social and geographical landscape. Because of my family, artistic background, and our relationship with neighbors, the generation and presence of this propaganda art also had a domestic and personal aspect. This has given me a unique lens through which to consider the role of the artist and art in a fragile and volatile society. Because of this experience, the materials with which I work embody whole ideologies and ideas and civilize great violence and trauma that I carry with me and subvert, subvert through my practice in order to bring to this history a very contemporary relevance, even here on the other side of the world. I was born in, Georgia, I was born in the Russian diaspora in Georgia in 1976, as David said, and I became a Georgian refugee in Russia in 1992 and a migrant settler in this indigenous land in 1996. My ancestry is Jewish, Georgian and Russian. The capital of Georgia, where I was born is a very mountainous place where every prominent hill has a church or a monastery. Just in this image, I counted seven rooftops of the church. 
Also each square has a monument. Here we see Mother Georgia monument on the far right hill. And this is a central Lenin square with monuments to the monument to the communist leader made by prominent Soviet monumental sculptor, Valentin Toporidze. Here we see Toporidze in his massive home studio, sculpting one of his Lenins and Stalins. Neighbors and close friends with his family for three generations I grew up playing with his granddaughter, not realizing that this experience would come to inform my future work and my understanding of the importance of art in a greater sociological discussion. Toporizo was very prolific, and these are just a few other examples of his monuments. I quite like the dynamic monument Call to Peace on the left, which was made after World War II and is still there. I spent most of my childhood in this fabulous Toporizo's garden, home and studio covered with sculptures and monuments in the making, climbing the giant fragments of Lenin and Stalin heads and being surrounded by other works, artworks, which was a great playground. This childhood came to an end when as a teenager I experienced the collapse of all major elements in my life. Crisis happened in my family with the passing of my father followed by the breakdown of the country and the implosion of the education system. This is the parliament building in the center of town next to Lenin Square, which we just saw before. In here, we again see Toporizis monuments of farmer and the worker. In 1989 is the beginning of Soviet Union breakdown. And I remember the Soviet army tanks rolling in past my windows as we also lived on the main street and about hundred people died in clashes at that time. 1990 is when Soviet monuments were toppled. These are the Toporizis monuments that we saw earlier. Lenin was toppled then as well. 1991 is the official end of the Soviet Union when Georgia became independent. And this also marks the start of a three year civil war with political infighting, devastation and devastation of the town. In the center here, we see a school building. In front of the school, there is a sculpture of two famous Georgian writers, also made by Valentin Toporize, and they're still there standing. During this time, with not much electricity, gas or provisions in the country, I found my consolation and serenity in long hours of art making and piano playing. Despite the odds, here I am playing a Prokofiev concerto with the Georgian State Orchestra with my family all being, being musicians and artists as well. It was a natural place for me to land. And in 1992, we escaped to Moscow as illegal refugees flying out on a military plane from a country in a curfew lockdown. Without documents, I couldn't go to school for a year, but eventually at the age of 18, I became a student in this fabulous publishing university studying book design and illustration in this book shape building. Also spending hours traveling in Moscow Metro every day with these incredible architecture and monuments. We migrated to Australia in 1996 and I became children's books designer and illustrator. And for many years, I was living my dream making these books. But by night, 2009, at the age of 30, 33, I entered VCA undergrad painting department, becoming more interested in fine art. And during this year, the seeds of my current practice were already there. Oh, I'll go back. Here I developed an interest in personal public memory and the inadequacy of our burial sites to convey the enormity and richness of a life. I began to subvert gravestone epitaphs to explore this idea. On the left, it's a painting of, uh, with the frottage greatly enlarged and taken out of context. On the right, I asked my family a friend and friends who I left behind in Georgia in Russia to write about how I was remembered. And I present, presented those quotes as gravestone epitaphs on this obelisk. And by the end of that year, I was pregnant, becoming a mom in 2010 and in 2011 again. Although I was still working on book illustration in retrospect, I see this period as a time when I stood back from fine art practice allowing the concepts that I've been exp exposed to and the ideas I've generated to cook while I lived the normal life I had to come to lead. 
As an experience, this was invaluable to my worldview and is in stark contrast to the events that catapulted me back into the fine art in 2017 with a fierce energy and sense of purpose. These events began with the terrorist act that happened in Burke Street and led to a sudden and nationwide change in Australian streetscapes that triggered traumatic memories for me on a fundamental level. The safe urban world that I've grown accustomed to and brought my children into was transformed by the brutal presence of bollards, giving an overt military atmosphere to the places where people live and move daily. Whilst many people around me seemed immune to this, their significance, I experienced within me an awareness of the clash of eras and the changes alerted me to the shifting acceptance of violence as a prominent feature of daily life across the world. The, recognizing those great stones, uh, rec recontextualizing those great stone epitaphs, I started turning the bollards into memorials with this series of paste-ups. About the time an artist collective uh, was formed where I was invited, it was called Seven Artist Collective, and they gave me a confidence with this transition to transition into the art world. Julie Shields, an artist who I always admired, became my mentor and generously helped me through staging my first solo exhibition. Julie and I collaborated here on this project, Concrete, Concrete Knowledge, where we stenciled bollards with quotes about freedom and justice. By, by many famous thinkers and philosophers, a project that juxtaposes culturally and historically evolved values against this concrete object symbolizing just the opposite. Soon after, I staged my first solo exhibition at the Living Museum of the West, where I presented replicas of bollards from many countries where terrorist acts have happened, creating this strange landscape as kind of an anthology of bollards I've made these bollards in my front yard, mostly from recycled polystyrene boxes, rendering them in tinted concrete, designed to draw attention to both the unpleasant novelty and the unchallenged acceptance of these structures. They're paradoxically light and therefore dysfunctional, questioning the functionality and the meaning of bollards and the illusion of safety that they represent. Around the same time, I went back to studying at VCA to continue my education. In the entrance upstairs, one had to walk through the labyrinths of bollards to then get to the main installation of this bollard city exhibition. And here is a close up and one more. Bollard city was then re-exhibited at the incinerator gallery, winning a major prize there. And I changed the installation, making it site specific to this building, building's architecture and the dynamic of the group exhibition. I also renamed it the divide. Breaking up and dispersing the installation around the garden and each gallery space, I placed these 35 bollards in the entrances and made them functional again. They blended in with the architecture, often unnoticeable to visitors who I found sitting on them, yet looking strange and out of place, just like in the city. Still, uh, I still move to work with symbolism of ball arts, perhaps for the sake of satisfying my own psychological reaction to this major change. I continue to develop them into an extended series of works. And I found ways to approach the gravity they represent in playful ways, making the innate tension of inherent violence more approachable and, encar and encouraging the ongoing discussions. Safe Passage was my first live performance and video work. Thank you to my rock of a friend, artist Chris Fantana, who helped me to carry out this project. We carried this bollard around the, for a while, sometimes placing it next to the real bollards, sometimes walking next to the pedestrians as if protecting them. Here, playfully and directly, the work addressed a serious topic of the time of what are our fears and where is safety, gently confronting pedestrians too. I might just play a little piece. <laughs> Thank you. 
And with these temporary public art installations called blockage, I returned back to the streets. Uh, there were three installations and three locations funded by the City of Port Phillip Council. This bullet of the tree installation was in front of St Kilda Town Hall and references John Kelly's cow up the tree. Playing with the paradox of weighty materiality and its symbolism, I was trying to humorously engage the pedestrian with this serious topic. The second structure in this series was called Safeguard and installed on St Kilda Beach near the famous pier, ridiculously out of place, trying to look like a city viewfinder for the family with holes for the eyes and fake coin machine. It was deliberate eyesore and a comment on the changing nature of the border security in general. The third installation, Building Blocks, was on Acton Street Plaza in St Kilda, installed, installed at the edge of the road where you would typically have the real bollards and working against gravity and common sense. I'm being playful here again. So I'll just play a tiny bit of the performance. And also thinking further about ideas of living with internalized fear, I photographed bollards in domestic spaces, making these fears physically visible and also turning domestic furniture and piano into bollards, thinking about how the fear is within us in our heads and homes, not on the streets. Around the same time in September, 2018, I went back to Tbilisi to stage an exhibition I'd been thinking about the place has changed a lot and the Lenin Square is now Freedom Square, looking like this. I stayed with the lovely Toporidze family, who are all artists as well. The grand family home with the sculpture studio and garden was sold and there is now a high rise in that spot. Toporidze's public sculptures were mostly dismantled and, and melted down. The remaining studio archive of Valentin Toporidze containing about 100 cluster molds and models is all that remains. I found it like this, kept in a garage storage of another sculptor. In a double erasure after downsizing, the family got rid of all the molds and models of Lenin and Stalin, but only one Stalin accidentally survived. All the other sculptures you see are of exonerated Soviet figures, poets, writers, farmers, miners, workers, and just human body studies. I borrowed, that, borrowed them to curate this installation called 100 Years After, 30 Years On for the Tbilisi Trey Emil. Here I arranged them like a pile questioning the sociological value of these sculptures, but also like a barricade, relevant to my concerns of the time with the rise of autocracies and far-right leadership around the world, as well as the rise of the cult of Stalin in Russia. This installation questions the potential of the remaking of these propaganda monuments with these molds and models, and also they look like bodies, symbolizing their lives lost in violent struggles, as well as hopes. After my childhood memories of Toporidze's grand sculptures, I was surprised by how small and fragile they appeared. The passing of time and decay, how, with passing of time and decay, how much sadness and beauty they embodied the unexpected combination of sculptures together, the compositions that created many narratives. Coming back to Melbourne after this exhibition, I started to focus on the monuments I found locally in Australia, considering how the history they represent and fail to represent run parallel to the histories I've been working with. The language of monuments became my primary material, allowing me to step back and consider global narratives from local perspectives and challenge the function of these artifacts. Uh, artifacts are created to perform. My work, Monuments and Movements, was exhibited here at Margaret Lawrence Gallery for the Marches Prize exhibition, creating replicas of Melbourne's colonial monuments in the adjoining Queen Victoria Gardens. These three structures represent the grandma Queen Victoria, her son Edward VII, and his son George V. Many Australian people note how monuments are invisible. However, they're never invisible to me. I always notice monuments, I study them and they tell me a lot about the place 
And with these forks on wheels, the flat silhouette structures are foldable and movable. I wanted to activate the monuments and make them visible again. Here's the detail where the structure is disassembled, but with the potential to be assembled again. Akin to the idealist, idealistic constructivist sculptures, I activated the city and the monuments with these live performances. Walking around the South Bank Street and the Queen Victoria Gardens, the wheels making a great noise. The video documentation of this live performance is called Royal Parade. It was exhibited here next to this installation. And towards the end of 2018, I acquired Toporiz's archive, which I exhibited as monumental ship just after it arrived from Georgia in a shipping container, fresh off the boat, so to speak. Monumental shift references the enormity of the archive's recent move and the cultural, historical, and geographical dislocation. Here displayed simply on the floor, a painting department floor, and relaying on the significance of the geographical movement and the sheer beauty and history evident in the fragile pieces of this of pieces for its impact. This incarnation of the archive talked about the legacies that artists create and the responsibility that comes with them. A graveyard of Soviet monuments and how are they relevant now? Looking at them, what can we learn? Soon after, I was invited to create a stage installation for a music video by Okenio. The song is called Anthropology. Okenio is Australian of African descent and appearing in this video like a live monument referencing or enacting Sarah Bartman's story. For the first time here, I combined my two bodies of works, finding a workable combination with bolides and monuments. I, experienced, I exper uh, experimented with this combination again in my installation at the Cathedral Cabinet in the city between, searching for a visual relationship between the past and the present, using objects that symbolize power and threat. By bringing together the fallen monuments of state power and strength from two different histories, the installation talked about our fragility, vulnerability, and fear. And my next installation at George Payton Gallery revealed for the first time publicly a 160-year-old original marble head of Russian Emperor Alexander II by famous sculptor Peter Klot. On the sides of the head are put fragments of the previous work presenting the replicas of Melbourne's own colonial monuments. The idea was to parallel these two royal, royal histories who were actually closely re related but held very different futures. This is how I discovered the original head of the Russian emperor in Georgia when I was staying with the Toporidze family during my triennial exhibition. The story goes that Valentin Toporidze himself as a young sculptor, a sculpture student was tasked to dismantle this monument of Alexander II in the same center of Tbilisi. This was the communist order to remove all Tsarist monuments 100 years ago. However, Valentin Toporidze decided to secretly save the head and hid it in his home for all these years. Finally, his family revealing it to me in 2018. It was a dangerous secret. His own Soviet monuments would later stand in the same place where Alexander II was dis dismantled. This is the incredible timeline through monuments in the center of Tbilisi in Georgia, from the Russian colonial monument to Alexander II, dismantled by communists and by Toporiza himself, to the monument of Lenin, Lenin by the same man, torn down in 1990, and to the full devastation of the civil war, and now to the Freedom Square. Interestingly, the current monument is donated by artist Tseretelli. His imperial, this imperial looking neoclassical sculpture is patron saint of Georgia, St. George. For strength, strength and might, it is also a religious symbol. It is strikingly different to the surrounding architecture. And I wonder how long it will stay there. Back to Australian politics and federal election of 2019, which were rather disappointing. My experience of Soviet history was again brought into perspective by concepts of freedom and choice represented by elections themselves, coming from a country where people could only vote for one party. Democratic elections are a great privilege. So I became interested in the sculptural form of this polling booth 
and the personal responsibility that it represents. I began experimenting a lot in my studio with the cardboard. And after we had 2020 New Year fires, I traveled to Gippsland burnt out forest together with photographer Lucy Forster, who helped me to photograph video and video this project. I placed the original boating boats in the burnout forest. They kept falling down in the wind, swept empty, and windswept empty forest resulting in this symbolic two-channel video work. Coming back to Melbourne, I then turned these polling booths into shapes reminiscent of trees and covered them in charcoal. To my amazement, the texture of the cardboard covered in charcoal revealed the texture reminiscent of the burned tree bark. This was staged as one day exhibition, a symbolic re-election day, complete with the burnt ceramic hot dog sculptures at the entrance. Thank you to artist Lotte Schwedtweger who helped me by making these hot dog sculptures. Not, uh, not long after this exhibition, the lockdowns began with COVID, prompting me to reassess my domestic and studio situation and leading to an extended relationship with the materiality of my practice by experimenting with film. In this, instance, in this intense period, I created my first short film, feeling like it is some kind of end of the big sociological and cultural era, and we are at the verge of something new. I call this film Terminus. Finding myself at home with all the monuments, this strange and distressing time was reminiscing of, reminiscent of my childhood. This is one of the scenes in the film. Short on the mobile phone, using technology I had at hand, the film presents a series of tableau vivants. The slow moving camera creates a sense of a witness view and a perceived narrative, no words spoken, no real action, no special effects, lighting or actors. All people in the film are frozen in that moment, like a photograph or a sculpture, against the logic of a moving image, warping the time, a slight move, a blinking of the eye betraying the static image, the sensuality of looking at this almost Flemish still lives and simultaneously portraits and landscapes and listening to piano music, a major element and narrator in this film. These sculptures, books, people, food and music here gain an equal value. It feels surreal, evocative and absurd as if trying to put my finger on something paranormal and invisible, yet grounded in domesticity and mundane like these potatoes. I'll play a tiny fragment. Oh, maybe. I use the slow parts of Mozart's piano sonatas and music composed by my father in the middle as an emotional combination sequence. These are more uh, stills from the film. And this installation view, this is installation view at the Blindside Gallery complete with the multiple piano stools. During this period, soon after Black Lives Matter's protests around the world, I was commissioned by Wyndham Gallery to make this short film called Embedded Set in my studio, it is at once an archaeologist's camp, a history museum, a bedroom, a public square, and a home. News footage of falling monuments brutally cuts into the, this quiet, ambiguous space. Universally recognizable and uniformly generic, it is hard to place it in any particular time and country. This is actually a footage of Soviet monuments falling more recently in Ukraine, timeless. So the reiteration of history, the film speaks to this moment. In the end, the slow panning camera zooms on me sitting on the bed in a dressing gown, recounting history from a vulnerable personal position. During the lockdown, during winter, I also started a short film series called Living Room. First 10 films were released in 2020 on Bass Projects TV, featuring Melbourne artists in their home studios making art and films, revealing their incredible rich, unique and fascinating worlds. 
This is then juxtaposed with the places of the employment, bringing to our attention how incredibly hard artists work to sustain and fund their amazing practices and the immense contribution to culture they make. This is an ongoing series with, uh, with films featuring more artists planned to, release, to be released this year, eventually creating documentation of a particular time. And finally, this brings me to the installation called Apotheosis which was opened today at the Living Museum of the West, as well as Margaret Lawrence Gallery. And it is part of the exhibition, uh, Image is Not Nothing, Concrete Archives, which was first held in Adelaide. The exhibition is split between two venues. The second part held here, the Margaret Lawrence Gallery, which I said, presents the incredible works by local and international artists and is curated by amazing Lisa Redford and incredible Yoni Skes. The installation is an iteration of Mike Pelisi triennial work 100 years after, 30 years on. Sitting next to Phil Collins's work, it's in conversation with it. Inspired by painting of Russian artist Vereshagin called The Apotheosis of War, the installation this time takes on the form of a memorial. The image is not nothing concrete archives is an exhibition that explores the ways in which acts as nuclear trauma, indigenous genocide and cultural erasure have been memorialized by artists and others. It comes as a result of research by curators Lisa Redford and Ioannis Gays, whose field work has encompassed sites of significance, including Auschwitz, Chernobyl, Fukushima, Hiroshima, Maralinga, New York, Wounded Knee and former Yugoslavia. I think this is a seminal exhibition. Please see it in both locations and keep in mind that it requires time to see all the powerful short films in the show. And this particular installation is at the Living Museum of the West location. I have another upcoming show where my work diverges, but, we'll, but I'll close here with apotheosis as it tidily brings me back to a place where my current series of exhibition practice began. And when I look back over the past few years, I still am surprised and amazed by how my relationship with art and material has allowed me to reconnect with memory and how materials of my own memories have, have connected so much with major historical events. I'm reminded daily of the power of symbolism and beauty and feel very privileged to be able to revive things that have been lost and to be able to see those materials to contribute to contemporary discussions. Thank you. Thanks so much for that, Nina. Um, we really, really appreciate you sharing, um, sharing so generously, but also, you know, taking us through um, you know, taking us through that journey from, from Georgia right through to Melbourne and, and then back to Georgia. And, you know, it's not as simple as cut something off and move on. It's, it's clearly a part of you. And, um, uh, you know, that, that, that history, it's just so rich. And uh, I don't know, for me, it was really interesting seeing the way that your practice, that you found a way of, of bringing those two quite specific locations to, together to create um, an understanding of global concerns, not, you know, whilst they're highly specialist, uh, specialised to the location, they've got a global resonance. And that's really exciting to see. Um, if people have questions, please use the, the Q&A facility. Um, I'd like to ask you, Nina, like, uh, it's so great that this image is up. Because I wonder if you could just share a little bit about um, how you get this, you know, this material, uh, not just to Australia, but just the physicality of lugging this material around. And in your in your presentation, you showed it in a number of iterations. Um, if you could share a little bit about just how you physically do that, but also um, I'm just wondering if you could talk about you know, whether you see yourself having some responsibilities around this cultural material. Yes, for sure. Thank you, David. Um, 
it's been quite a journey, me for the first time kind of re, um, reuniting in a way with this monument since childhood. And then uh, Soviet, having a pre-existent pre idea of these monuments as Soviet monuments and what they represented and something to despise in a way. Even though I had the personal connection, they still represented to me that Lenin and Stalin on, you know, and the, and the body history that it in, uh, represents. So first off, I straight away, I only had a week to install this work in, in Pelisi Triennia when I arrived and just finding this archive and tracking it to the location. It was just an incredible feat. And um, I don't think I had the love for this archive, even though they were so precious, there was no time to kind of, to really take care of them. And so there were these multiple workers that were helping me lugging them up the fifth floor manually. And it was just an incredible thing. And people on the streets who saw this, they recognized the monuments and everybody talked about the history. It was familiar to them still. So uh, later on, as uh, the archive arrived here and they started to live in my house in that COVID year, I, I sort of developed a really personal relationship with each one. I know them so intimately now that it actually really pains me almost to present them like that, even though I take a great care looking after them. I, it, it still really hurts me to put them like this uh, because now I see their individual personality and their beauty and I value the story that they carry. They're sort of like my teddy bears in a way, do you know, like the things that I played with in childhood. And I didn't, didn't recognize that until they were in my house. And it is a huge responsibility. They absolutely overwhelm my place here. And that's why I made this film, uh, Terminus, but living with them and how that brought back, back, back the memories and sort of became this device um, for sort of thinking about these histories and mnemonic device in a way. So um, they're very, very fragile, they're plaster. Uh, and uh, so the, I repaired some of them, even though at first I thought they're broken and that's how they are. But then I found some things that I, if I didn't repair, they would just absolutely be lost. So there is a great responsibility that I feel with them. And, you know, I was offered to, uh, to somebody wanted to buy this whole archive straight off when I first exhibited it, but I just couldn't do it. You know, I couldn't sell it even for a lot of money because what it represents and the potential, it's so important, I feel, to keep working with that. And I think I'm only at the beginning of unraveling uh, what they can tell us and what I can sort of experiment. So I see this, uh, all my work is modular with ball arts or with, with all the projects I did or these, they're modular. And every time they change location or a gallery it becomes another work and then other different, um, uh, different context to experiment with the ideas and continue thinking around the topics that concern with each work. And so in a way, this is, these are all sort of practice, practice kind of pieces. What happens if the monu monuments are fallen off the pedestal? What happens if they are like piled up? What, what, ha what, what, what how does it make us feel, you know, in, in this configuration? And then kind of, uh, so I, I'm growing uh, with this process and my thinking is growing and evolving. And so I'm definitely not done. While I feel I'm done with ball arts, this is just the beginning of thinking that I'm sort of developing around this and who knows. Mm, thanks. Um, I wanna, uh, a question's come in that I wanna kind of frame a little bit. Um, the, the question is, um, I was wondering if you could share your journey on managing your art practice as a mother with a young family and how I want to frame that, um, Nina, firstly to the person who asked that question, thank you. Um, but I wonder if you could talk about that, but also talk about what it was like as a child, like when you grew up with these objects and perhaps reflect upon, you know, now you've got kids who were your age when when you saw these objects and talk about it a little bit like that. 
Yes, yeah, so it's a great question, interesting, but um, yes, yeah, so my, my children uh, sort of in the backyard around the house, we have bollards, <laughs> you know, the great, great, heat. and it was so strange, you know, with the play dates or children, people coming over, my whole house is covered, was covered at the time with bollards and it was just sort of a strange thing. I thought maybe I'm crazy at some point. <laughs> because they do take over the house and they also I keep have, having to reassess what they mean in their house and this gives me kind of more inspiration for work but also my children it's part of the vocabulary the bollards or the monuments and you know that like me I'm not appreciating then what I was playing it was just part of the normal climbing the Stalin's head lying there you didn't think twice about it it was just like a normal thing to do what else do you do you know I didn't go to we didn't have playgrounds I don't remember any playgrounds that's what we had trees and sculptures you know and so I guess my my children I uh, think I'm a bit my children maybe think that it's a bit strange what I'm doing it's not like other parents and you know I, ha I wear many hats and um, when I go to school I make sure that I don't want to embarrass them too much <laughs> being a you know <laughs> and I just sort of and I don't I'm not allowed to speak Russian to them at, in front of the you know children other children and so you kind of I, I create as much normality and, 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 and standard of the Australian standard as I can. And just even thinking how I call them Australian names, they're called Audrey and Henry. It was my kind of idea of sort of being part of this society and transitioning here. So, you know, like I keep it a little separate, but you can't help it, but it, 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 it's every way it penetrates. And I do have incredibly supportive um, family and at the end of this sort of madness of art in a way that really sort of has such a strong strong pull in my life uh, I just it's it's a it's a great centering um, thing and the pleasure of going back to home where things are just simple beautiful mundane you know just cooking meals and doing things rather than you know, if I didn't have children, I'd be just working day and night, being obsessed with this art. So it really gives me this incredible balance to live a life and not just be an artist, which I feel I would be kind of pursuing otherwise and be really overwhelmed. And who knows, you know, it would be no good for me then. Um, I'm going to finish with the last question. Um, and it's, I, I read it all. Um, Thank you for sharing such a personal journey with the evolution of your practice. It is such a potent and exciting practice and has something of the epic. And in particular, the last work is quite cinematic. I'm interested in the role music has begun to play in the work, as it also seems to reinforce this epic, these epic qualities of the work. Could you expand on that? Oh, yes, thank you. What a great question. And thank you for the comments. Yes, I, the music uh, has, has been, you know, I was a, like a professional pianist playing all my childhood uh, for hours and hours every day. And my family are professional musicians. So in, inevitably, it all comes back. And uh, when, you know, when I see videos, artists making videos, I don't understand how some of them don't have sounds. So for me, it is sound is such a fundamental thing to, I realized to that um, perceiving any image. And so I actively started to employ that device to tell stories. Um, I guess I'm a more of a person of the music or sound and image rather than a narrative person. So that's why all my films, they don't, they, they, they're only audiovisual. And uh, also it keeps, uh, keeps it really open-ended and, um, uh, rather than for me, the words would, would close the meanings. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm looking to use the sound more. And I guess it even started at, uh, with this Royal Parade when I was weaving these structures around the South Bank. The clatter of the wheels became something so powerful, uh, just equally powerful as an image of these uh, structures. And uh, I realized then that it's an incredible device, which I'm really sort of familiar with as well. And I feel it, I'm feeling it. Um, so I want to use it uh, a lot more somehow, we'll, we'll see.
Nina, we've come to the end of the talk. Thank you so much for your generosity. Thank you for taking us through all of these projects. And, um, you know, a big congratulations to you um, on, on all of the accomplishments. Um, I'd just like to remind people that Nina's work is on show at, the, at Melbourne's Living Museum of the West as part of the exhibition, The Image is Not Nothing, Concrete Archives, curated by Lisa Radford and Ioani Scarce. As Nina mentioned, the, the exhibition is actually now open. It's on, um, it's on show here at the Margaret Lawrence Gallery and also at um, Melbourne's Living Museum of the West. And there are a number of um, public programs associated with that. You can find out about those from appropriate websites. And next week, um, Lisa and Ioani will be talking about the project as part of Art Forum. So we hope you'll join us for that. So thank you again, Nina, and we look forward to seeing everybody at Art Forum next Thursday. Bye-bye now. <laughs>